we'll go ahead and get started, and if other people come in, they can be seated. Uh, for the districts out there, rest easy. This uh, presentation has nothing to do with radiation control or emergency preparedness, but it has everything to do with public health and how one individual with a very, very strong commitment and a great deal of sweat equity can change a community for the better. Uh, Dr. Anil Henry serves as director of the Christian Hospital in Mongeli and uh, the, the, the Christian Hospital and has done so since 2004. Uh, Dr. Henry attended medical school at the Christian Medical College of Bilor, and his surgical re residency at Ludahana. And I apologize for the pronunciation. Uh, he is married to Dr. Teresa Henry, an anesthesiologist, and together they serve an appointment for Global Ministries. He's the son of an American missionary nurse, Nancy Henry, who traveled to India in 1960, and married Dr. Viru Henry, a surgeon. Now retired, they ran a Danish mission, hospital, and school of nursing in India for 25 years. Uh, the Christian Hospital was selected in 2013 as an international medical rotation site for the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, and the founding dean and president, Dr. Cindy Johnson, predicts that Mangeli will become the premier site for Virginia Tech International Medical Rotation Program. This past February, George Washington University School of Health Sciences also approved Mungeli as an international medical rotation site. In, in December 2014, it was awarded its first USAID grant for equipment to be used to save lives of women and children living in extreme poverty. So without further ado, Dr. Henry. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. And uh, I think I'll just move right in um, with what I have to say. Uh, a whole bunch of slides and pictures that will kind of show you as to what we've been up to and how we've been uh, dealing with the challenges that we've had to do with uh, running a hospital and everything else that we do right now. Uh, we are based in a place called Mungeli, and it's it was a little bit off, but it's the state of Chhattisgarh, which is right here. And um, it is one of the backward states of India. Um, it was formed out of this big state called Madhya Pradesh, called the Central Pro Provinces uh, from the British time. And they carved this area out because it was a, a backward area and they wanted to focus on it better. So in 2002, it became a separate state. So that's where we are right now. Um, the hospital was founded by Dr. Anna Gordon. Um, it was in 1896 that she was there, and uh, she was the first doctor, of course, who started out, and this was the first building that was built and, uh, in 1902. And this building still stands right now, and you'll see as it is, it's, uh, changes have occurred to it, but basically the same walls and the same thing that is there. By 1926, the front of it got changed, and these three arches came up uh, over there, and you'll see that. Uh, as we see pictures changing. Victor Rambo was an American missionary. He grew up in India when he was about 13 years old and his parents were missionaries there taking care of an orphanage. And he trained in Philadelphia, uh, decided immediately the moment his training finished, he took off to India and he went to this place. He was a pioneer with eye surgery. And the thing was that due to the intense heat, uh, people would get blind from the age of 3540 uh, due to cataracts and there was nothing that the government could do in those days and so he started a concept of doing eye camps um, there would be somebody who screens so a screening team would go out and they would disinfect a, a classroom out in the village and then the surgeon would come and they would do 200 300 cases a day and uh, in those days it was just the lens it was just the lens that had to be removed. It's not like the intraocular lens that you put in right now. So it was a very simple procedure of just taking the lens, giving them a thick pair of glasses, and off they went. So that was the concept that he started. So the hospital was very famous for eye care. Uh, Mrs. Springer was another famous one who was a nurse, and um, she was um, a widow who decided to do her nursing uh, at the age of 45, went there at the age of 51, 
and was actually the master builder of three wards that were there. And she did a lot of building, remarkable lady in, in what she did. But here you can see in the background are the Springer wards, uh, three of the wards that she made. But this scene was in the 1940s and it could be the same picture taken today as well. So the amount of change that has occurred in the villages is very little. You could have people dressed like this, you still have the cows, the bullock carts, the cooking with utensils. If it was a colored picture, it could be today. That's the amount of, you know, what has happened is pretty little in, in all these years. So 1970, this is how the wards look, and this was a cooking area that they had. Uh, but due to a lack of leadership, the place was falling apart. As many of you know, um, missionaries were eventually, by the 1965, by 1970, most of the missionaries had been kicked out of India. The simple way of being kicked out was they just did not get visas to come back in. Uh, they very clearly had to come back on missionary visas. And since 1970, there's not been a single missionary visa that has been granted. So it was their way of moving the Christians out. Um, the hierarchy, the government, is very threatened by Christianity. Uh, as you know, it's a Hindu country. So 90% of the population is Hindu. About 7% is Muslim. And about 3% are others, of which 2% are, is like Christianity. So missionaries were really, they were scared of the fact that they were converting people and they wanted them out of the country. And so places like this that had leaders and mission work that was going on from churches in the States and from other parts of the world kind of found themselves with no leaders and had, were not prepared to hand over things. And so this place started falling apart. You can see the windows and all that are, are giving away. My parents, as Steve said, uh, my father is from India and he's a general surgeon. Um, the, my mother came out in 1960. Uh, she was the youngest of eight and um, came out as a single lady and met my father. Uh, they were again in a village hospital and um, decided to get married. It was a very different day in those days. Uh, somebody from overseas getting married to somebody from that country. Uh, when I was born, people thought that I would have stripes. So they came from distances to see what I'd look like. Um, it was really a, a very different day. Um, even the church didn't know what to do with my mother. And so she was taken off the rolls because in those days, a lady could not go out and get married to somebody from the native land. A man could do it, but not a lady. So it was definitely a different time. And since then, we've lived our life going backwards and forwards between the States and India. Um, after I did my studies, I came here to the States and I worked in Nashville and Tennessee. And uh, I pretty much realized that I was stuck in a system where I really could not do much more than my general surgery work and just sitting around and doing hernias and mastectomies was my hope for the next 40 years. Um, it was good money, but it wasn't anything that I was doing with my life. And so I got in touch with the same church and I said, do you want me to pick up something and I'm willing to go. And so they said, we have this hospital in Mungeli. It's, you know, it's old. It's been almost dying for the past 40 years. And uh, let's see if you can revive it up. And I'd never been there before. I had no idea where I was going. Uh, I asked my father to go there and just look at it and tell me what his thoughts were. And his only thing was, look, you're looking for a challenge. Here it is. So that's how I landed up there in 2003, August. And this was our home. So that was what was there for us. And that was our living room. And then that was the kitchen. And we never looked back. Just kept moving. Uh, this was the hospital. It was pretty much in shambles. Um, the buildings were all falling apart. There was no maintenance. Uh, we had about four patients in the hospital. One of the ladies that was there had a huge pyonephrosis, a kidney that was full of pus and ready to rupture. And we knew that we had to go in and operate on her. And so I found an old EMO machine to give anesthesia. Uh, my wife was not there with me at that time. So gave anesthesia, operated on her, and that was my first day at work. Um, the wards were all full of bats. Uh, just one fourth of the area was being used by the four patients where the rest of it was all abandoned. And patients very quickly came and they started filling up and they would come in whatever way possible, be carried, bullock carts, tractors, whatever way they could be brought. We had very little, like the old injection room. This is, we had no incubators, so just a simple light bulb to give heat to that child. 
this upper room was the only room that I had and that was my casualty, my ICU and my delivery room. There were three beds in it. Uh, but this one room is where the four patients were and that started filling up very quickly. This was the upstairs where the baths were, so we started renovating and cleaning that up. And patients just came from all over the place. You can see that the relatives are even downstairs. I mean, they're under the beds, filled up. We had firewood, pots, pans, everything. So it was a mess. And anybody who is a nurse can imagine, you know, who do we inject in the middle of the night? Who do we give our medicines to? How do we walk around? It was a mess. You can see people sleeping all over the place. And uh, relatives are there all the time. You have one patient, you may have at least four or five relatives that come along. And it was really a, a difficult thing as to how to take care of these crowds. So by 2005, we built up this area and it's free of cost. That's how it looks inside. Just a simple place with fans. They put a mat on the ground and sleep. Uh, they can put their, their uh, cooking stuff and all their goods into these lockers and lock them while their relative is in the hospital. And it's free of cost. And then there's a place where they can get a meal for about eight cents of rice and lentil. And that's of course the restroom and the incinerator. So we put this up in 2005 to help get all the stuff out of the ward and start concentrating on patients. So this was our first ICU in 2005. Just a simple ventilator, it was air conditioned. So it is the only air conditioned thing that, that you could find. Um, so this first ICU served us um, for the beginning three, four years. And then we had to really do the same place is done up again and now we are in a situation where we can take care of sick patients we have five ventilators syringe pumps and the whole works that are there uh, our patients come to us very sick because there are quacks all over the place who get the first hand of any patient that is there and quacks could be people who have no education or they could be somebody who's you know a third grade or fifth grade pass something like that learn how to give high antibiotics, IM injections, and start an IV. And they're the first people in the village that a patient would go to. And so they would come to us only when they lose consciousness or they become really sick. And that's why this ICU is, is pretty much packed at any given time. And then we made a post-op area that was there. And then we have a second ICU as well, because the first one just get packed. And then as they settle, they still need monitoring. So we have a step down ICU for them. These are the same wards that you saw before. So they're all cleaned up and new beds, fixed up the walls, brought some light into the place. Uh, brings. We have lots of deliveries. Last year we had 740 deliveries in the hospital. So you can see there's a lot of action. So four delivery tables and there's something or the other happening most any time. Uh, supported by a nursery. Uh, it's like a neonatal ICU. That was our old one that was there and we have a new area that was there. And uh, the smallest baby we've been able to save is about 700 grams. That's about 1.2, uh, about 1.2 pounds. So you have amazing stuff that you could do just with good nursing care. One of the things that even you would have trouble taking care of in this country would be a child who has an omphalocele. And you can see most of the intestine is out. And so we took the child in and operated and we've used a sterile blood bag and we've covered the, the intestines with that and slowly over a period of three weeks we've been able to push the intestine back into the, the stomach and then we take the child back into surgery and that's the last stage that is there and the intestine is now back inside and the child has a chance to grow. So these are things which even in the best of situations you would have trouble dealing with and it's for us it's very clear either these the parents will bring the child and say either you do something or we're going to take the child home and we're going to die. So it's do it or so we, that's you have to find ways every day to deal with situations that are there. We have a nice aviary right in the center with birds and all and of course our little newborn over there. <laughs> and uh, so that's fun. Um, building community is very important. We all live on the campus. So you're together 24 hours a day. Whether you're on call or not on call, the activities keep on going through through the day. It's very important to have ways of community building. So everybody's birthday is celebrated, anniversaries are celebrated, anything special that happens, it's all, uh, you know, in the, everything is celebrated together. This is how my, my electricals looked 
when I got over there, this is the way the powerhouse was. So you can see all the wires and one day the place was in smoke. So this was the first generator that I had. Uh, just enough for the operating room light um, if the electricity went down. And the electricity does go down. If it goes off, it may be off for hours, days. So you have to have backup. So in 2004, we had an automatic generator that started up uh, when the lights went off. And that was 2004, 2007, we got one twice as big as that. And that's being downloaded, uh, taken off the truck. And this year we got one three times the size of that. So you can see that the smaller one has gone upstairs and the big one is being moved in. So these are huge generators which, which give us our power supply so that we can keep on going on. You can imagine we have patients on ventilators all the time. And so within five seconds, you, can, you have to hold your breath for five seconds till the electricity kicks in. So yeah. that supports us a lot. This is a little friend who I got to know when he was very small yeah. and uh, was being nursed by this dog. And pretty soon he's ready to eat chicken and then I couldn't play with him anymore. <laughs> uh, there was no laundry so this poor lady who's there had to wash everything by hand. And so he went ahead and this is the first laundry machine that we have and an extractor so the whole thing can be taken care of one per just by one person running the laundry department. And you can see these buildings, that's the old building that you saw in 1902 that was built. It has bricks on top of it and the bricks are there because the, jump, the monkeys would jump on the roof and the roof would come off. And so they didn't have any money to fix the roof, so they just put bricks there so at least it would, it would stay on. Uh, so these are all, that was 1902. These buildings were built somewhere around uh, 1955 and we started working on them. So we used the same walls, the same structure and we put a floor in between because these were high bungalows and so we could just put a floor in between and so now we have the utility of two floors. So I have the outpatient downstairs and then upstairs we have classrooms for the nursing students. And then we added on these two parts. So this is a conference room for workshops and all. And this is a blood bank. So the whole structure is there. We paved all the roads, uh, made it look better, have walkways because the monsoons will come for three months. It'll be raining continuously. So you have to have continuation in the hospital. And the place is filled up. So you have, as usual, the crowds are there. We work uh, six days a week continuously. And so if we have a chance, we take the staff out for picnics and just to let the steam out. It's a fun time that is there. So you can see them all enjoying. We have a boat that we throw out in the water. It's just a lovely time for people to let themselves go. Uh, we do around 2,500 surgeries a year. So that I had only one operating room and it had these two beds in it and it was kind of hard to manage. We were there in theater from early morning to late night every day. So I had two more operating rooms that we added in. And this is the same operating room now with a whole lot of gadgets. And we do work with laparoscopic. I do urology work. Uh, you saw the C-arm there. So we take care of fractures of all kinds, do platings. This is an, in, uh, an interlocking nail in the tibia. Um, this is a nephew who came to, to visit me from Des Moines and he said, I want to help you out in surgery. So we helped him scrub up and everything that was there, but he didn't last too long. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the old injection room and that's the new injection room. And it's just all areas of the hospital having to be cleaned up. As I said, people are paying out of pocket. They have no money, so they wait as long as they can wait. And so this child comes just because he couldn't put food in his mouth. And that's how he looks after surgery. A little child who had a rupee coin about the size of a dollar that was stuck in her throat for nine months and came to us. You could hear her outside just fighting for each breath. And it was completely stuck and fibrosed inside. You could see it with a scope, but you couldn't yank it out. So in the end, we had to operate on her and you can see her triumphantly holding onto her coin. Uh, a lady with a huge tumor again and how she looks post-op as that big thing is removed out of her tummy. Uh, our lab is pretty much, uh, everything is mechanized now. So we have a big auto analyzer uh, that is there, a biochemistry auto analyzer. We have a cell counter and these are my lab techs. We have basic microbiology and we have a blood bank. So that's taken care of by these four people. The old dental area looked a lot like that. And now we have the new dental area and uh, we have two dentists. Uh, one is 
a volunteer who's from Memphis, and she's out uh, spending this. Is, she's going to start her second year of work with us now. So it's a very busy area uh, where both of them work. We had no place to keep staff, so I built this in 2006, uh, six apartment buildings that were there. We started physiotherapy, and here you can see a young man who had a motorbike accident and was a quadriplegic. And about two months later, he is slowly starting to get up and start walking, and he left the hospital walking. We still keep the legacy alive with eye surgery, so you can see uh, intraocular lenses being, being put over there, and you can see the first dressing change that is there, and then they are ready to go home with their, <laughs> with their dark glasses. Uh, we're into Wi-Fi and security cameras as usual to keep up, keep up with the times. Um, technology is very important. Again, parties and fun time for everybody that is there. We have a continuous stream of Danish medical students who come continuously throughout the year. They stay three months and that's usually booked two and three years in advance. Uh, we're up to date with our x-rays, so everything is on a PAX. Um, our medical records are all, we have a paperless OPD. So patient comes, gets a photograph taken, is registered in the, in the system. Um, cell phones are very important, so they get an SMS. You have now registered in the Christian Hospital Mungeli. Here's your registration number. They go to see the doctor. They send their lab, lab tests. Everything is done within one day because they, they come from such far distances. So we, they see the doctor. Investigations are done. Moment investigations are done. Their reports are, are sent back as an SMS onto their phones. They know that everything, if they go back to see the doctor, the medications are written, and so that's how we are able to maintain all our, our data. Uh, we're the only hospital in that area that owns a CT scan. That is a very big deal that is there. Uh, we have a color Doppler and an ultrasound. Um, of course, upper GI scopes and a tracheobronchoscope for pulling out foreign bodies and for doing diagnosis. Uh, we had the old incinerator that was there, pull that out. We have a new one that has just been installed. Again, having fun, uh, that's our home, and we have a lot of parties, a lot of times together where everybody, whenever we have visitors, the light keeps on going. And that's the way we can rejuvenate ourselves and charge our batteries. We had a dream to start nursing training because we're in a backward area, it's nurses are hard to get. So we said, let's start our own school of nursing. Uh, I didn't have any place, so that's an old building that was there. We, added two sides to it and in 2011 we had the opening ceremony for that building and that's how it looks and uh, so that was our beginning of nursing training just a simple room there where all their food is cooked and here we are There's, these are the classrooms that I showed you the upstairs of the same building the 1902 building there are three classrooms there uh, very sad situation with rural people 98 percent of rural people live on less than a dollar a day and the state of, of women is really pathetic. And uh, that is one thing that we are uh, in the way of building up. This, of course, uh, Steve mentioned. Uh, Cinda uh, Johnson was uh, there for one of the capping ceremonies, and that's when we had our relationship start with the, the Virginia Tech uh, Carilion School of Medicine. Uh, so we have the first years are inducted, and they get their caps. And the states, we have stopped that right now. You don't have nurses with caps, but we are, they are very proud of their caps and when they get back into the wards. Uh, I came there for the graduation last year, and these were the first two students who had been on their rotation over there and had a ball of a time. And this year, there were four students who went uh, and had their rotation. But these are our nursing students um, who have gone out and won some prizes. Amazing stories. Uh, they are all from the state of Chhattisgarh. We believe that this state is backward, and so we do not take any girls from anywhere else except that state. So, and they all come to us, none of them know English, and so they are learning English and nursing at the same time. Uh, all their books are in English, their classes are in English, they, it's like a crash course. My mother is the one who teaches them English uh, when, they, when they join. And this year we had our first batch that passed through. So we have 19 new nurses our first batch uh, getting out. Our challenges are different from what you have here. Uh, definitely a friend, a snake that came to our house to visit us, about six and a half foot long. Once in a while we get bullet injuries, 
this was a, a child, it was a bullet that went off at a wedding and one guy was shot through his abdomen and was very badly injured. We almost he arrested on the table but we were able to save him and he did well. And the same bullet went and lodged into a little child right next to the spine and we got the, the bullet out. So if you come and see us sometime, Kana National Park, if you know Jungle Book, was the place is just about three hours away from us. So Mowgli and Balu and all that, uh, they're waiting there for you. And that is Sher Khan. Uh, so that's what everybody comes to go and see the tigers. There's a good number of tigers that are there. And this is our first crash where we have young ones who are there as their mothers are working away. We always have inaugurations for everything. So this year we had two school buses that were there and you can see the students going on for the first ride that was there. We have the, the only lift in Mungeli. Uh, it's not the first, it is the only one. So it's a service lift that takes stuff up to the top and for storage. We are always con building and constructing. So these are old uh, doctor's houses that were there. I put two more on top of that. Last year we started the Springer Community College and this is a vocational uh, training for uh, their nursing assistants, physiotherapy assistants, and computer hardware networking. So that's what we're teaching them. Uh, these are 8th grade and 10th grade dropout kids who pretty much did not have a future with anything and we're trying to build them up so they can have a vacation. As I said, construction happens all over the place and I have a, a construction crew of about uh, 35 to 40 people who are continuously building things. We started the cancer center, the, the building of it in 2011. Uh, that's the way it looks inside the waiting area and now the machine is installed. Uh, pretty much within the next two, three months I should be getting this rolling out. The idea is to give, it will be the only low cost cancer treatment center in the state when it is up. So everything else there in the cities, they have places where they have Linux. This is a cobalt machine which is very low maintenance and of course it is fixed up a lot more from what the old cobalt units were like. Uh, but it will be the only low cost machine in the state. So in 2005 we were requested by the church to take over a broken down school that just had 80 kids in it and it ran in this bungalow that was there. Uh, we bought a school bus. Those are my two boys who were studying in Nashville. Well they were in preschool in, uh, in Nashville but they studied for five years in the same school. Uh, before they took off to boarding school. So we, we, pick, we picked up this uh, school in 2005. The idea is to give low cost English medium education to village children. So we have over 500 village children who come from all the surrounding villages. We're now just over 800 children in the school and we wanted to move out away from, uh, this is a play place, it's the only play place in Mungeli that you have. Uh, we wanted to have a new building and grow, have up to a thousand kids because we are having to refuse kids continuously at this point. Uh, so we went straight to work and that's the first floor, the ground floor of my new school. Uh, you can see the corridor over there with these kids who are happily playing, running around. And that's how the construction started. And now I'm going up and I'm doing the first floor and that's the toilets which are being all fixed up. Uh, so it, trying to build a, a solid place where we can uh, house a new school altogether. So this year was the year where our first batch of 12th graders passed through and we had 100% result on them and they've all graduated. So everything is about attitude and faith and you can see an old man who refused surgery, he had a fracture femur and we said don't worry you'll get well. Um, so we put an interlocking nail and he's up with physio and up with that. Here's another elderly person with a carcinoma of the cheek. So you can see it's a huge mass that is there and we've taken a chest flap and have uh, fixed him up. So that's his flap over there. This child looks happy, but if you look closer, he's only got one finger. The rest have been blown off by a firecracker. Uh, a priest who's come to bless a child who's in the ICU. Uh, we have people who come all the time and cheer up, uh, bring different kinds of skills. Uh, Felicity is from Australia and she's an occupational therapist who was with us. She's been there twice already now. And last year we put in something which is totally fun. People have never seen a swimming pool there. Mm -hmm. And so we have swimming classes. We realized that uh, when we went out for picnics, only those who are above 40 could actually, did actually know how to swim. 
because now all the rivers and the lakes are all polluted and there's no place where they can even learn how to swim. So we said, let's just put in a pool and it is just the best thing that we did. And this is now what is waiting for inauguration right now and the kids are looking at it waiting. The pumps are being put for the water slide. So that's something special. So we're looking at things from a distance and you look at that tree, uh, but as you look closer, there's a community that lives there and you have to get into what's going on over there in order to think about bringing change <laughs> and bringing change as a community and how we can work together. And that is the thing you have to every day look at how you can make life better for the people around you. And we went in there thinking that we would be into health, but the aim was changing lives. We started out with health, but we realized that people with diarrhea, malaria and intestinal obstruction will always be there. And if you want to bring about change, you have to bring it about through education. And that's why we pushed that the hospital is the main thing that is there and it's the, the stronghold. And then from there we branch into and help different programs come up, which some of the programs that we've been talking about that are there. And this is the staff in the same building that I told you, 1902, with the three arches in the back, which has been uh, restored and, and we continue to use it and it's the center of the hospital. So pretty much that's where we are. Uh, you can see the web address over there. It's www.chmungeri.org. Uh, join us on Facebook. Uh, there's stuff that is continuously going on and we keep on putting up posts of you know, new activities and new things that happen at the hospital. So that is a little bit of what I do out there, uh, trying to reach out to communities, trying to work with various programs that are there. The USAID grant has been given and we are getting into a, a mobile van, which a mobile bus rather, which is going to have, it'll have a dentistry area, it'll have a small operating area for small procedures, even if a cesarean has to be done. And it'll, be, um, it'll have a doctor's consultation with an ultrasound, a small lab, uh, all this on a bus, and we're just uh, getting that ready. So it's an exciting thing for people around there to be able to at least have some kind of modern medicine that is going on. Uh, when we reached over there, every month I would have at least 10 babies who would be dying in their womb, mother's womb because they were just too late to come to a hospital. Uh, now that situation is a lot less, we still have ruptured uteruses, uh, maybe about one or two a month is what we see, but it has come down drastically. This is an area where the infant mortality rate is around 71, which is very high. Um, India, as it is, they say 300,000 babies die in the first day of life. And it's about one third of the total statistics of the whole world. So it is what we are trying to do is motivate women to come to the hospital. At present in the state, there's hardly 14% of women who have hospital deliveries. So the rest of them are trying whatever they can all over and they come to you with eclampsia, ruptured uteruses, IUDs, things like that, which are totally unacceptable. And that is the change that we're trying to bring with maternal and, and child health that is here. So it, it is a challenge and change comes in its own way, but education, I think, is the most important thing that we can quick, quickly, you know, in the times that are there, educate people in order to take care of themselves. Would you explain the baby box program in that way? The baby box program is something which started out in Finland they have realized that it has brought great change to it. What we are trying to do is get mothers to come to the hospital. So one of the incentives that will be there is the baby boxes. And this is going to be a box where when the mother comes, uh, every live baby that leaves the hospital, they will be given the box with all the supplies of um, cloth diapers and powder and stuff like that to take care of the child with diapers and all that. Now that the cloth diapers and the little bibs and things will be stitched in the community college and so that we can employ, uh, you know, get their skills onto the same thing. And so each mother that goes will go with, with a box and the, the cost of each box is around $25. So they will go with something and that is to incite them to come to the hospital for a hospital delivery so that they can go home safely with a live child. And that is the incentive that we're moving towards that side so that they will come not only in time 
but they will also hopefully come for antenatal cares because antenatal care, three visits uh, for a lady in our area is hardly somewhere around 20%. Uh, they will just not come for antenatal care. Even if they come for antenatal care, it is usually the mother-in-law who says, I had my baby in the field. You don't need to go to, to the hospital and you know, why should we, we have the expense for you? Um, you're going to try at home. So the village midwife will come and she'll be doing provaginal examinations. At the same time, the quack will be injecting IM injections of Pitocin. And if you're lucky, the baby comes out. If not, it goes into a deep transverse arrest. It's a mess. The, the uterus is pushing away and you're in all sorts of trouble. So when everything is lost, that is the time that the, the midwife says, it won't come out. Go, 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 go away from here. And then they'll be hunting for help and they'll land up to us. So it is a very sad situation. Uh, mother's rights are very little. Women, of course, if you know about India, the first thing is if you have a girl baby, the parents know that they're gonna have to pay a dowry for your wedding. They know also that their daughter will not be there for them when they grow old. They'll have to take care of their in-laws. The parents are left out. They also know that every time that their daughter is in trouble, They'll have to run over there, pick her up, get her, you know, back to health. But basically, she's the workforce of the in-laws. And because of this, the ultrasound machine has been a mess. And people are having sex determinations. And so now the number of women have, the numbers have gone down. So to every thousand boys, there's hardly about 930 girls. Uh, so, and the number is still going down. And they basically get sex determinations done about the babies if they find out it's a girl baby. So it's it's totally a different situation, and it's a it's a hard way to to bring about change in that kind of a situation. Let us say. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Is there anyone on the, uh, the polycom who has questions? Rich, are you on? Good. Oh, I have a lot of questions. Oh, good, please. Hi, my name is Janet Wright, and I'm the school nurse consultant for the health department here. Okay. I've been a registered nurse for over 30 years. I'm so pleased to hear you have nurses in your family. And I'm really pleased to see brand new nurse graduates in your country. Yes. Um, tell me about the, um, share with us about the funding for your program because I, one of the first things I heard you say was, when our patients come, it is free to them. When our patients come, we take care of them immediately and we have two ways of doing it. Yes, they have to pay. But we, anything in emergency, everything's taken care of, but we make every patient pay. They have to pay something, they're given a bill. Um, it is way less than what they would have to pay in any kind of a private hospital. It's about one third of, of the cost there. This way we are able to take care of a patient. If they are poor, we very quickly find out. You can get the idea from the kind of food they eat, the kind of visitors they get. They also realize that I don't have the money, they'll come to you, but our idea is to reach to them first. And you catch the nurse on the floor and you say, just send them to my office beforehand and you know, we help them. So we give, every month we give about $3,000, three to $4,000 as concessions in our, the working system that we have. But we insist on people paying. Uh, we've had a delivery for 25 cents. So whatever they have, we're ready to take. Um, but we are completely self-sufficient. So with whatever we get, we're able to run our programs, Whatever help we get, like from USAID and stuff, it just boosts us up many, many steps ahead. But uh, we do our construction with our own money. We hope that we get money for construction. We haven't yet. But uh, all that we've been doing is basically from our own funds. Um, overseas, I have friends and churches that are there. Our usual thing was somewhere around twelve to $15,000 uh, a year. And uh, this year it's gone up to somewhere around 30,000 in the year. 
but uh, our whole running cost of this whole thing is somewhere around a million dollars a year is our turnover for the whole facility all, and all the services all the services including wages including your... wages the whole turnover everything is about a million dollars so that we're able to just get that from what we do so everything is user fees even the school is giving as you heard low cost english medium education so it starts with about two dollars a month and goes to about four dollars a month is the fees that they pay to send their kids and all the school buses are run by my staff who are in the maintenance so they're not only drivers they drive for one hour in the morning one one hour in the afternoon to leave the kids the rest of the time they're taking care of plumbing electricity carpentry right, multi-skilled yes absolutely awesome. everybody is multi-skilled right. so if the driver is not there even i go drive the school bus and leave kids and drop them so everybody is multi-skilled with what they do the other thing that, that you will realize is nursing is something which was looked down upon i don't know if you know that i do not in the hindu religion to take care of somebody else and to clean somebody else up is looked down upon. Nursing started somewhere around in 1920. And it basically, you know, Florence Nightingale and how the nursing movement started. But in 1920 was actually the first mission hospitals started opening nursing training. And even till now, about 90% of the nurses in the country are Christians. The Hindus will not want to send their daughters right. for nursing because it is below, it is low caste to have to clean up somebody. So a barber is low caste, a person who cleans your houses, cleans your toilets is somebody from the lower caste. And I don't know how much you know about the caste system, but you have basically four ca castes that are there. So you have the priests at the top, then you have the warriors, then you have the businessmen, your tradesmen. And then there's a line, and below that is the outcasts. So the outcasts are the ones who do all the cleaning. And that's why nursing is not something which is thought of. It is now, presently, we have in our batch, we have at least uh, almost half of our batch are Hindus. And that is because nursing has now become a little bit lucrative. <laughs> so it has been, become a way in which families realize that the worth of their daughter is going to be a lot more, the dowry that they have to pay will be less, and they can find a better husband if they go through nursing. So that is how the change has occurred. But otherwise, nursing was not the preferred. Doctor, yes, because doctor, you're just shouting out the orders and that's a hierarchy that they feel that's there, but nurses, so that, Thanks for sharing that. Tell us a little bit about the political support that you have. I assume there is support for the facility and its work. Absolutely not. Or how is how is it tol how do they tolerate the great service you're providing? In one way, they, people outside are not very happy because they feel that missionaries were there before and everything was free, and now you have to pay for something. So the way that we deal with it is something very special that has come out and evolved over the last five years is something called the smart card. And it started out as an insurance program for families below the poverty limit. And so you have about $300 worth of inpatient treatment, um, 300, yeah, 60, ah, so about 600, sorry, $600 for a, inpatient treatment for a family of five in a year. So with that, we can do a lot. Our hernia surgeries are hardly about $80 to get a, in, you know, inguinal hernia done. To open an abdomen will be about $150. So, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously low. So we can do a lot with that smart card. But that smart card is not taken by any of the private hospitals. We're the only ones who who accept the smart cards. So that is one way in which we are also able to enable our patients to get their care. So that that is, so we do charge, we do charge, we do have a system in which, you know, and, but we cannot refuse anybody at all. We take care of anybody that comes. Sure. 
but the but the political system as you're saying the the people around us uh, one thing they look at is ah you take the smart card which is a government thing uh, you know so they demand more uh, from what what they get mm -hmm. that is one issue that is there as far as religion is concerned we are we are very clear we treat everybody we are called a christian hospital but that doesn't mean we we right. refuse anybody at all and so that way it is a long term people who are educated very quickly understand that here there's something special going on and so quietly we do have the support uh, we have people who support us in the community any issues that occur with the government most of the time i have spokes people who will immediately address it even while i'm here i can give phone calls and get my jobs done if there's any issue that happens so there are people who are quietly helping us out and assisting us i figured there were there was something have, uh, having served internationally I, i served in haiti a long time ago for a week and uh, was appreciative of that country and culture equipping and teaching their own folks to yes. hold them a accountable but b build their infrastructure to be able to care for one another culture to culture and it sounds uh, similar to what you speak about asking the patients to pay something that's really saying to them you own a part of this you also bring in your your nursing students in and teaching them on site is a requirement for the nursing student graduates to pay back some time exactly. to the hospital exactly so our our nursing course costs uh, about $2200 for a three and a half year course uh, it is <laughs> it is subsidized the regular cost for nursing if they would go to a private institution is somewhere around 800 uh, $8000 if they went to a private institution so they are already getting subsidized by us and what we say is you work for us for two years and that's when you're paying back mm -hmm. okay. so they work for us for two years and they're free to go at any time they 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 say that they want to go. This is the amount you have to pay, and off you go. We we don't hold you back at all. But that is the way we work it. When they get admitted, we very clearly, again, we have uh, young girls who are on scholarships, so they are actually going through nursing free of cost. Okay. So and then when they are enabled and a nurse, then they would pay back to the hospital. Everything, of course, is interest free. So there's no. you know interest or anything looked at it it's trying to enable young people to be able to take care of themselves and in that way the best ones we can keep so that is one way we have it and every year we have apprentices with us these are 12th graders whose parents very clearly have said that we cannot take care of our children and can you please help us so they work as apprentices in the hospital mm -hmm. they would be in medical records or you know help out in OT pushing gurneys around uh, we find a job for them and so they are with us for a year after the year is over we look at what requirements we have in the hospital so i have people who are into x-ray technology courses um uh, uh pharmacy um lab lab technician uh, lab technician courses so all different kinds of things whatever their interest is we enable them we send them out for further studies of course a lot of them by the time they finish that one year now are looking at just nursing because they see their nursing seniors who are there and say wow this is great and uh, you know that it's much easier rather than going into an uncomfortable situation and having to study outside somewhere so every year we have at least five or six of them and some of them are christians some of them are hindus sure and uh, so that's how we're able to invest in these young people and give them a better tomorrow and make sure that our program continues on as well can you help me to us to know the nursing education they receive what would what would it equate to here in the US education it's a gn it's a diploma program okay it's like a gnm or your rn rn program that is there so the next oh, step they have, so registered nurse registered nurse they will be a registered nurse not licensed practical nurse no then from okay. there they would have to go the next step they go for is their bsc their bachelor of science oh, okay so associate so they're basically associate degree nurse too. yeah, yeah. That, and that's so, very good yeah so they are completely licensed and at, at that's the main level entry level of nursing over there 
So the next level from there would be BSc, the next level would be a master's. Uh, so they would have to do a BSc two years and a master's again two years. And that's pretty, then from there, you know, you go to your nurse practitioners, things like that. For, uh, let me know when to stop because I only have three more questions. Um, but, um, you, you really are training many more than just medical professionals and nursing professionals. Exactly. As you've explained and described, you were a very unique and powerful adventure. For those who then are equipped with the knowledge and skill set and experience, are they able to go outside of the facility to other areas of India then and, and continue this work? And are they respected and received in the other parts of India? Absolutely. They are then they can go to anywhere in the country and work after they finish with us. Okay. And in the same way, we, as I said, we have young ones who are going to different areas. Uh, so we have a master's, one who is doing her master's in nursing is going to come back and she'll be the principal of the School of Nursing. We have another one who's doing his BSc. He's already done his um, operating room. Uh, he's basically an operating room trained uh, skilled nurse and he's doing his BSc coming back. We have a doctor who's coming back in uh, June, July, who's a radio oncologist. Um, we've had three, four doctors who we have enabled to do their training and then come back again. So we at all levels, we have a way in which we're trying to build these people up. And it's not only in health. We have teachers who are going for their bachelor's in education, their diplomas in education. Uh, we're pushing them and we make it very clear that we will not have you on as a permanent teacher on staff till you at least have a diploma or a bachelor's in education. So we're pushing them and we say, we will help you, we'll help you financially, but this is something you must do sure. so that we can build our standards up. So it's, and we have, in the same way, we have students who are coming from all over in the States and from Europe to come for the electives. So as I was telling Steve, at the end of the month, I have four students from Butler University I have students who come from Eureka, Piedmont College, uh, Wichita is trying to get online. Uh, there's one who's coming from, some students have come and there's another one coming from Texas Christian University, um, all over the place. And we have, there's a classmate of mine who's a nurse practitioner in, Fres uh, in Loma Linda. And so she does research and we're doing a major research project which has been going on for the past almost four years now. Uh, studying women who have come to us and have had intrauterine deaths and how they're accepted back in the society. Um, the latest one is how their husbands deal with it and get them back into society. So that's an ongoing as our numbers are changing and getting less of these, these women that are there. Wow. You spoke a little bit about the, well actually you spoke a lot about the infant mortality rate there. Of yes. course you're in the Virginia Department of Health. And, and we know that that's an indicator of the overall health of our community that we live in. Yes. Your mortality rate, I heard you say, was over 70%. 71. And, and so, but I didn't hear you say um, anything about breastfeeding. Um, and I know from international work I've done, in, in some parts of the world, that's not seen as a, a health, a, a, um, a measure of good health to give that baby a chance for survival. And certainly here in the U.S., we go through cycles of it being accepted and not. Thankfully, for VDH staff, we see an up, an, a surging upward of breastfeeding being more tolerant. But can you speak to that? In, in Ours is very simple and very easy. Breastfeeding is something that most every woman will do because it's free of charge. And we go on to the other spectrum of it, mm -hmm. is that you know that after six months, you should start weaning a child off. Mm -hmm. They will continue on a year and a half, two years breastfeeding, three years, okay. and eventually you know that that baby is now in nutritional problems. Right. And that is what we're having to face. Our number one issue is nutrition. So people are don't have the kind of nutrition that they need. Proteins are very low. And so that's how they fall into the trap of infections and disease. And that pulls them very fast down because they just don't have any reserves. Right. And uh, so our common thing is any 
major surgery that I do, um, I may have a intestinal obstruction that is obstructed for a week. Um, perforations would, would have perforated when I left the hospital. There were two patients who had perforations for at least five to six days and had peritonitis. All these kinds of patients that are there, we somehow or the other, we are giving them enteral feeds. I have a lot of burn patients. Uh, burn patients are there. Again, the body is just dying for proteins. So we are putting nasogastric tubes, jejunostomy tubes, and we give them the cheapest feed possible is milk and eggs. And so they are on, they start with two eggs a day, go on to six, 12, 20, and they're usually on somewhere around 25 to 30 eggs with two liters of milk per day. And that's when you see them just, their cheeks will start becoming pink. And believe me, none of them die of heart attacks due to cholesterol being high. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. The body just sucks in whatever right. it can take to repair itself. It's amazing. But that's the way we do it. We put a nasogastric tube. We actually stitch it to the nose so it can't come out. And we tell them, you have to increase, you know, 5 kgs or 8 kgs and then your tube's coming out. So that's how we deal with our nutritional issues. But that's why kids... Um, Mothers in the, in the village, they have kids who have brown hair and they actually think it looks good. Mm. But we all know very clearly that that's, that's a sign of malnutrition. A child should be having black, rich hair. Right. So... I appreciate that, that breastfeeding is accepted and encouraged. That's great. My last question is for you. Do you ever get a day off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here with Steve. <laughs> you said you were available and came for consult. So. Thank yeah. you very much for answering the questions and for your service. That's that's huge. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Come over and as I say, drop in. We have people who come in and it's a learning experience from, for us. Uh, we don't worry about skills. The main skill that you need is everybody needs more than willingness. Everybody there is learning English. And so if you can speak English, that's pretty much the only skill that we can start with. Okay. So we're very happy with that. And uh, it's just an environment where we're trying to push people to be able to con converse in English so that they can open their realms, uh, you know, to a, to a world outside. It's, it's really something which is a very hard job to do. If you can imagine all these village children, they go back to homes where their parents have never been to school. They don't know English. Right. They don't have any English television, no English papers, nobody to speak to them with. So when they have, we have visitors and people who come, they're literally, what's your name? You know, they just want to talk, 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 talk. And it's, it's amazing that that helps them so much. Thank you. Yes. You know, you talked about the low literacy levels. And I just wondered what kind of tools you use to do health education. Um, because. We also confront the literacy population. A lot of our things are pictures. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pictures. So we have charts, our nurses have charts for uh, whether it's how to take care of your child or whatever. Everything is in visual. So that's the way that, you know, conversation is much easier. It's... Uh, that's when you're in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Is there any way you put stuff out in the, in the community without a teacher or... Exactly. Everything would be with pictures. Yeah. So it's one country where if you go around, um, all the parties have signs. So the hand is the Congress and the lotus flower is the BJP uh, because people cannot read Congress and BJP. So every political party has a sign. So you will see those signs with any poster that is there, you will see the sign of the political party on it. Because people can't. Who paid for it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is there a resource that you could share? I mean, like a web page with pictorial. Um, um, it's it's on yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. It's okay. you. If you just Google me in, yeah. you'll get everything. Okay. So just my name. You can start off with that, and you'll get to the website. You will join us on Facebook, and please do join us on Facebook. It's a fun thing. Um, I don't write many reports at all, uh, so once a year is what, what I send out to people on my mailing list or whatever it is. But uh, these are ways, small things on Facebook and stuff that we, we keep on and these are things that we're working on also. 
because we have people who come to us from all over and they say we want to be in touch, you know, and want to know a little bit of what's going on, you know, new buildings, new things, new programs. So it's just a small, small thing there. So do, do look us up. Google me in. And anybody who's coming Hi outside. Hi. Hi, this is Mary Parker. I'm with the Portsmouth Health District. I did have a quick question. Yes. Okay, I'm totally grateful to hear um, all the work that you've done and to see the progress that you've made. Um, could you talk a little bit, and if you have already, forgive me, could you talk a little bit about how you may or, or may be thinking about using community health workers um, within the um, grass of your hospital and any of the work with the, the mobile van that's coming up? Well, community health workers definitely will be linked with them. Uh, we have already decided uh, the mobile van, of course, will be connected to the hospital and the database that is there. Um, cell phones are really something which are being picked up and being used as a powerful tool. And we're using them as a powerful tool in our uh, organization at every level. And so we, that is the way in which we feel that we can reach out to people at the times of emergency as well as in follow-up that is there. So we have a special database now. Well, a special thing that, that our software does is like for women who are pregnant and, and who come and register with us, there is an automatic um, uh, messaging system which tells them, okay, it's time for your, your next trimester is on and you, know, you need to get back to the clinic and show yourself. Uh, we've also realized that a mobile situation which has basically everything on it lab investigations, ultrasound and all, is the right way to go because it's much easier than actually having a community health center in a village where you have to continuously employ a person to be there all the time. So people will automatically find out that on this day of the week, at this time, the mobile vehicle will come there. And it's much easier. So you have a fixed staff that is there, you have communication with cell phones, and nowadays, you know, even distances, our patients, our regular patients come from at least 70, 80 kilometers, which is to about 50, 50 to 70 miles is our normal radius of patients. But we're at least trying to hope that the mobile van will reach at least 25 miles around Mongeli right now. And that is one way in which we feel that we can track these people down and at least try and help them out uh, when they're in trouble. Now, this will your community health workers be more or less trained volunteers, or will they be health professionals themselves? They will most probably be our own nurses and our own people who are on staff, who will be part of the staff that go out in the mobile van itself. Uh, the government already has a, a good network of community workers that are there, and the issue is we are trying to plug in with them to make use of the facilities that we have. Because in their situation, yes, they do have uh, they call them primary health centers and things like that. But their primary health centers are very clearly cannot take care of the level of, you know, for example, um, a mother in, in distress. They can do certain normal deliveries, but after that they're in complete trouble. They have no way to monitor mothers, uh, no ultrasound machines, nothing like that. So it's usually a nurse who's in these primary health centers. So they have community workers already out there. Uh, they call them Mitanins. And the idea is that we are linking up with them so that they can get help from what we are doing. All right. Well, thank you for the background. I appreciate it. Good, good. Anybody else? Um, Anna, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So hi, I'm Lindsay Kaywood. I'm at the Lynchburg office, and so I have a comment and a question. I actually lived in India for a short amount of time do, working at a place very much like this, and um, one of the things that we had a lot of success with was that when we did our village health workers, we purposely chose untouchables, and then when they were sent back, they also were able to have quite a bit of status, and it also kind of just helped raise the status of untouchables in the communities that they went back to, so that was kind of a a secondary achievement from that. And then we also started expanding into focusing on mental health and social relations. 
where we were, we had a lot of victims of bride burning. And one of the things we did was we started using stories and vignettes and plays to show how to um, kind of have healthy interaction between the sexes and even encouraging you know, young boys to start helping out their mothers at home with work and that kind of thing. And one of the questions I had for you was that where I was, water was always extremely scarce. That when we were building wells, um, having to have water shipped in, it was just always something that was a rare commodity. And you had this beautiful swimming pool and it almost struck me as a bit odd. And I was just kind of curious, did you have the water shipped in? Did you have wells? Like, how did you get enough water to have that kind of um, an amenity? The first thing is, um, I have about four bore wells on campus. Um, yeah. And I, we're situated right next to the river. And the river, of course, is, you know, it has water in it all year round. So I know that water is an issue in, in many places. Uh, believe it or not, once you do fill up a swimming pool, you keep that water there for at least eight to ten years. Mm -hmm. So it is treated oh, water. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it has its own filtration system. Uh, it's amazing how, if you take care of a, a swimming pool, it's like um, it's like a human being. I mean, you can treat it the way that you want, so that it is absolutely it stays that way. So it's something that I also got to learn in just the last year that is there. Um, you're very right about many of the things that are there going out into the villages. And I wouldn't say openly, I don't say that, you know, we, we pick up, you know, untouchables. I would say yes. A majority, almost 60% of our school children are outcast children. So, and out of our nursing education, at least half of them are from the lowest caste that is there. So we know that very clearly we are making that transition. It is not something that you openly want to keep saying. Uh, the government, of course, wants to know what castes are there and it keeps a track as to you know how many low caste people and what castes do you have each of your programs in. Uh, but that's a statistics, uh, that is just a a statistic to make them look good to say that yes we are picking up some of the things that are there but openly there's it is very clear that most of our people who we are reaching out to are from the lowest caste that there is so that definitely you are right and if you want to bring about change that's the place to bring it so yes so that's right you probably were a little bit northern you must have been in Uttar Pradesh or or somewhere around that where you were was it was it in northern India um, no. No, it was in Maharashtra. It's Maharashtra. near okay. Amitnagar or Pune. Yes, yes. yes. And uh, yes, there is that. It is always in North India, which when you talk about bride burning, um, when you talk about dowry deaths, that's all North India. And uh, South India, as you know, is very much forward. The literacy rate is much higher. Um, you know, it's totally a different situation compared to. Um, you know what North India is. The issues that we deal with are a lot of child labor, uh, dowry debts, um, yeah. but these, these are things. And child labor is one of the hardest things that, that you have to deal with because you're pretty much, you know, taking the hope away from a child from you know the age of they say from the age of five to fourteen is mm -hmm. the time when these guys are employed, and that's the time they should be sitting in school. So you've taken away their whole life just out of that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Anybody else? Anyone else? <laughs> Good. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it's been great. Do keep in touch with us. And uh, we're always happy to have people coming over or just communicating with us uh, as to questions and thoughts. And if you have anything that uh, you have that is an experience. We're happy to share, hear about it, and see what we can do better. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Henry. Thank you. I'll be sure to make contact information available should you need it. But again, he is easily Googleable, as they say. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've met few people with your energy. He, is, he, he really is quite remarkable and an inspiration, and I think. We'll go home and build a swimming pool. <laughs> but thank you. I, I, I know that the, the people here and 
on the uh, video conference. Appreciated your, your uh, comments and truly uh, your vision is remarkable and the results of your efforts are even more remarkable. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Hi, my name is Gail Austin. I'm sorry I was late. Um, years ago, I was working on a system, a bilingual system for okay. uh, training health workers in India in rural villages. Okay. And um, I had to abandon it because I and ended up going back to work, you know, actual paid work, and yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's sort of sat there. But um, I got as far as neonatal resuscitation, yes. and you can click a button and it changes from English to Hindi and yes, you know, all yes, this yes, sort yes. of thing. Um, do you work with, I know you work with village workers. Yes. Um, are there village workers that, um, you know, could benefit from a system like that? It was a totally charitable thing. Yeah. I. First of all, we'd be happy to see what it is, uh -huh. and then from there, mass produce it out or what we can do. But yeah. I, since the hard work went over there, I'd be happy to see what it is and sure. get you in touch with my nursing gang and you know take it from there. Yeah, yeah. So we've, I mean, we always we just had one nurse who came and talked about wound care, uh -huh. and so she came from uh, Victoria, um, British Columbia. Uh huh. So she was there with us for about four or five days. Oh, she had a blast. So she wants to send her students from there as well. But what I'm seeing, I mean, if you have material which is there already, you'd sure. love to see it. And sure. Yes, we ran 